Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and who else ever ever else might be listening. This is Dr. Matthew W.I. Dunn. This is a brief video, an addendum, if you will, an addition, if you will, to some of the other stuff, the other video lectures that I have given to you, my students, um, for this online course uh, during this past week. And uh, there were, while I was listening to some of the videos myself, and yes, I do actually listen to them, um, just to refresh my memory to make sure that I did cover certain things that I wanted to cover, I noticed that there were several uh, issues that either I forgot to cover in the videos or I did not cover well, maybe I made a mistake or something like that. So I'd just like to briefly uh, go over those things um, for you. Before we do that, let us begin in prayer. And a particular type of prayer is prayer that is singing. It's vocal prayer. And there's supposedly a saying or a statement from St. Augustine of Hippo that anyone who sings to God prays twice. And so I thought that we might um, sit back for a few moments and listen to this little song um, praising God and his son Jesus Christ through Christian heavy metal. This is from a band called Messiah Prophet. I was put on to this band, uh, interestingly enough and ironically enough, by my best friend in high school. Uh, this was back in the late 80s, as you will be able to tell from the music. Um, and he was an atheist. But he loved heavy metal, and he listened to Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Ozzy Osbourne and all those those people, Wasp and Alice Cooper, although I don't know if Alice Cooper was really so much heavy metal as rock, hard rock, nevertheless. And, you know, since there were a lot of occultic references and religious references and biblical references, uh, he knew I was the Bible guy because I wanted to be a priest at the time, and so he would come to me and ask me. And along the way, he uh, happened across uh, a cassette of Christian heavy metal, believe it or not. <laughs> yes, there was. There was Christian heavy metal. And this was the first Christian heavy metal I'd ever heard. And um, I actually, I, I, it's this, this particular song stuck with me um, throughout really the rest of my life so that um, later on when uh, I had some money, this was one of the first things I searched for, because I, even though I gave him back the cassette, I still remembered this song, you know? It's got a great hook, a great riff, but especially a great hook, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Jesus Christ rocks!
my lord is jesus your lord said it better myself guys messiah prophet ah very nice okay well let's get down to business i don't want to keep you here much longer than i have to because this is not a full video lecture uh but i do want to uh, touch on some things that i talked about you'll see here i have a powerpoint of the uh or excuse me, a PDF copy of the PowerPoint Sources of Authority that I used for one of the video lectures. You can find it on under the content collection. If you go to course content here on the left hand side and you click in here, I'm already here, see that course content, you go all the way down, you'll find out find uh, the uh, PowerPoints which I've uploaded for you. So if you want to uh, have them for yourself and you can follow along with me as I'm doing lectures and whatnot, at least see where I am. And they and also the PowerPoints have information on them. So they're an extra resource for study or for using for your notes while taking the uh, major tests. Okay, on this uh, sources of authority, the point, the thing, one of the things I wanted to point out is uh, under magisterium. Okay, maybe you'll recall this picture from magisterium. It might not be exactly the same picture, um, but whatever. Anyways, I just wanted to point out that this guy is Peter Appia Cardinal Turkson. Turkson. Uh, his last name is Turkson. Make that a little bit bigger so you can see it. I mean, that's a little bit too... Okay. Uh, Turkson. And uh, he is from Ghana, if I remember correctly. He is a, a cardinal from Ghana, or a man from Ghana. He's a cardinal of Rome, actually. But um, all cardinals are actually stationed in Rome, have their churches in Rome. But he is of Ghanaian extraction, if I remember correctly. In the uh, one of the in the portion of the video lecture where I was talking about magisterium, I believe that I incorrectly called him Cardinal Turku. Okay, I got his last name totally wrong, but it is Cardinal Turkson. So that's one thing I wanted to bring up to you. I think that might be the only thing um, in regards to magisterium. Um, another uh, issue that I wanted to address, just zoom out here, okay, and go up here. When we talked about the scriptures, and actually I'll stay in the scriptures for 
a little bit here. Let's start with uh, the uh, the uh, Jewish scriptures, and I talked about the division of uh, the writings of the Jewish scriptures into Torah, prophets, and writings. Writings, um, and I talked about the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch at one point, the five hinges. It comes from two Greek words. Pente, which means five, and tuchos, which means a hinge. So, you know, just like a book is is on a hinge, okay? The way a book is created, the, the binding is the hinge, the spine of the book. Um, but that's not the, the issue. I want you to know what the five books of the Pentateuch are, because they're very important. Um, the five books are, and some of you might already know this, first comes Genesis, the book of Genesis. Then comes the book of Exodus, then the book of Leviticus, then Numbers, and finally a book called Deuteronomy. Okay, so those, excuse me, I miss, of course I misspelled it. Uh, so those are the five books that are part of what is called the Pentateuch. Why are they important? Well, they're important for a number of reasons because the um, the books of the Pentateuch or the Torah, as a Jew would preferably call it, are um, kind of like the Gospels for Christians. They contain um, from beginning to end, from the fir first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Deuteronomy, they contain the essential laws for living uh, a Jewish life. Okay, so anything that has to do with Jewish ritual law, for example, um, uh, the kosher rules are found there. The Ten Commandments are found there. Actually, the Ten Commandments are found twice in the Pentateuch and the Torah, these five books. Uh, if you're curious, once in Exodus and the other time is in Deuter the book of Deuteronomy. Exodus and Deuteronomy, if you're curious. Um, and all sorts of other rules that I'm not going to get into. I mean, Jews are most commonly known for their kosher um, laws. You know, they can't eat pork and they can only eat certain types of food and stuff like that. So that those would be things. But there are also a lot of other stuff like ritual washings, um, the sacrifices to be offered in the temple and how they're supposed to be offered, how to ordain priests to serve in the temple. So there are other rules that are found. But anyways, so these, and it presents, the Pentateuch contains also the essential story of the Jews, where they came from, who their ancestors were, um, especially, and, and, and most especially the person of Moses. In the book of Exodus, we have the appearance of this man, um, Moses, the great lawgiver and prophet, um, who actually in, in, uh, is more important than some of the other ancestors of the Jews like Abraham and Israel. Moses' fingerprints are all over the Torah, and in fact, all over the Old Testament. He, um, Moses is a very important figure, and after Moses would come Jacob, the man Jacob, also called Israel. But you should know these five books. You should know that they make up the Pentateuch. Another reason why the Pentateuch, or these five books of the Pentateuch, are, are so important is because uh, they were for the Jew, for the Jewish canon of scripture, for the Jewish canon of sacred writings. Okay, remember we talked about canon. Okay, actually maybe we didn't. Uh, where did I put the word? Maybe I didn't put the word here. Um, the Bible. I thought I put it here somewhere. Oh well, I guess not. Um, but the canon of scripture, the the writings that make up the official writings that make up the the Old Testament, the Torah, these five books of the Torah were already well established by the time of Jesus and the apostles. There was no disagreement about what made up the Torah at the time of Jesus. Um, the other two portions of the Old Testament, like the prophets and the writings, well, those were kind of up for grabs. Okay, there, there is all sorts of evidence that we have from the time of Jesus around the time of Jesus, both before and after Jesus, that Jews were reading um, a lot more books uh, as part of scripture than were eventually accepted by the Jewish community. Okay, how do we, and, and evidence of this is in the Christian Bible, is in the Christian Bible, because I went over 
or maybe I mentioned, but maybe, but I'll mention it again. I think I did mention it. I mentioned books like Baruch, okay, the book of Baruch. Um, there are other books such as uh, the book of Judith. Actually, let me put this as uh, two pages. Uh, there's, uh, I mentioned Baruch, I believe. I don't know if I mentioned Judith, but I'll mention her now. There's the book of Judith. There is uh, a couple of books called First and Second Maccabees. Okay, and etc. and so forth. For example, and there are longer versions of certain books, like the book of Esther and the book of Daniel. Are those books, those two books are actually longer. Um, there are longer versions which came down into the Christian Bible than were accepted by the Jews. And I'm not giving you all of the books, but I'm just giving you some idea that the, these were extra books that were accepted as part of the Bible by groups of Jews, perhaps the majority of Jews at the time of Jesus. Um, and Christi and, and this, was this, this was the version of the Bible that came into the Christian church. The Torah was settled. Okay, I just told you that the Torah, everyone pretty much agreed. Well, there was pretty much 100% agreement on, on the Torah. The prophets and the writings were the problem. Okay, which books, all these other books out here in the prophets and the writings, what should we accept? Those were not settled for the Jews, and you should know that. There was no settled standard um, of which books should be considered prophetical and which should be considered writings. Uh, as part of the Jewish scriptures at the time of Jesus. It took about maybe a hundred years after the time of Jesus, sometime around 100 AD, circa 100 AD, for the Jewish community to decide finally, okay, these books are in, these books are out. The Torah, no question. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, but books like these, Baruch, gone. Judith, gone. First and Second Maccabees, gone. Esther and Daniel, yes, but only in their Hebrew form, which was shorter. Which was shorter. Okay. Um, and this is a traditional date. You know, this is what we're told. We don't actually know... You know, this, well, what I'm trying to say is that this date of 100 AD is just a traditional date that has come down amongst the Jewish community. Um, we don't have any, like, documents we can point to. We just have stories that, oh, yeah, these rabbis met a certain city in Palestine and, you know, decided finally which books should be in. Okay. Um, so you should know that if I asked you true or false, the canon of scripture, the, the standard writings of Judaism were set at the time of Jesus, you know, you'd say false. That's not, that's not true. The Torah, sure, but the writings were not, the prophets were not, okay? It took at least a hundred years after the time of Jesus and the apostles, um, after the time of Jesus, let's say that, for um, the Jewish community to finally settle it. For Christianity, it was pretty much settled, okay? The the canon of the Old Testament, excuse me, for Christianity, I should say, it came much later for them to accept, to finally officially settle what was in the Old Testament, but the version that came into Christianity was the traditional version, which um, had already been amongst the Jews already. Already amongst the Jews. Yes, I know I said already twice, so sue me. Okay, moving on. So, Pentateuch, etc. Um, another thing I'd like you to know that I did not have here in the PowerPoint, I guess it was too cluttered, maybe I should uh, have used another one, but whatever, you deal with what you got, is that the three divisions of the Jewish scriptures, I, I told you that Jews do not call their um, scriptures the Old Testament. That's a Christian term, okay? Um, but they don't call it Torah, Prophets, and Writings um, either, at least not in, not in English, or, or excuse me, I shouldn't say not amongst themselves. These are in English. What they do is they use an, an, an acronym. As you know, an acronym is a, an abbreviation of something using letters, usually the first letters of each word, an acronym. Okay, and they use the acronym from Hebrew. Okay, so Torah, I already told you Torah. Torah is Hebrew, which means instruction. So we have Torah. Prophet, the Hebrew word for prophet is Nabi, 
is Nabi. However, it's not prophet, it's prophets, plural. Okay, so you have to use what would be the plural form in Hebrew. And the plural form of one prophet, if you have two prophets, then you have Nebi'im. Nebi'im. Actually, you could probably put a, a, a whatchamacallit in there, an apostrophe in there. Okay, Nebi'im. This, this ending im is in fact like the S in English. Okay, and the, and, and the vowel changes a little bit. Um, it becomes like more like a schwa sound, an uh sound, nupiim, okay? Prophets and writings, the Hebrew word for writings is ketubim, okay? So you, all, you now already know a little bit of Hebrew. You can identify the plural here, im, okay? And so if you take that off, you get ketub, ketub, which... You know, just go with it means a writing, okay, a writing. It's kind of like a participial form, okay. So the plural of writing is writings, so ketub, ketubim, the writings. If you take, then, the first letter of each word, okay, you have... An acronym, T-N-K, T-N-K, okay? But if you're around a bunch of Jews, you know, like you're around a bunch of Orthodox or Hasidic Jews or even conservative Jews and maybe some Reformed Jews, and they keep taught, they don't, they're not saying tunk. They don't say, oh, did you, you know, did you read from the T-N-K today? You know, that's not how you form an acronym in, in Hebrew. In English, yeah, T-N-K, all right? But that's not how you do it in Hebrew. You put the letter A in between each consonant. And so you get Tanakh. You get Tanakh. So if you hear a Jewish person talking about the Tanakh, and sometimes you'll even see it with an H at the end, Tanakh. Um, but if you hear them talking about Tanakh, they're talking about the Bible. And let's not get into Chumash and Shas and all this other stuff, because those are different things, all, albeit related, Chumash especially, to the Bible. But Tanakh is the acronym for referring to the three uh, parts of the Jewish sacred writings. The Torah comes first, and then the prophets and the writings. Okay, so you should know that. I... Uh, talked about the four holy gospels of the uh, the New Testament and I forgot to point out to you as I was listening I forgot to point out to you that these numbers beside each of the names uh, e beside the name of each of the gospels um, these numbers are actually the dates when scholars believe around which they were written so I apologize for uh, glossing over that for forgetting that um, as I said mark which is highlighted, Okay, in a different color, and I even put asterisks next to it. Notice, people, asterisks. Okay, just just so you know, um, that's the pronunciation of the word. Um, Mark was written first, scholars believe, and by first, it means around the mid 60s to 70 A.D. Anno Domini. Matthew and Mark, as I told you, are believed to have copied Matthew and Mark, excuse me. Matthew and Luke are believed to have copied Mark, hence they, they would have to come after Mark had been written, yes, if they're copying from his gospel. Excuse me, a little coffee break there. And so scholars believe they they wrote around the eighties, from eighty to eighty five, for each one of them. Who wrote first, we don't know. Who, who, between Matthew and Luke, it's anybody's guess. Um, and then com coming up the rear, last is the Gospel of John, the latest of the Gospels, and scholars believe that John's Gospel was put into written form sometime between 90 and 100 A.D. Now, these dates are approximate. I'm giving you the approximate dates um, and not everybody agrees with this. I mean, there are scholars, not not the majority of scholars, but there are some scholars who would argue for earlier dates. And um, personally, I think that John is placed a little late, a little later than he should be. Um, 
I personally think that all of these predate or come from around the time of 70, but that's my my opinion as a theologian um, and one who has um, delved into from time to time biblical studies, but I will not test you on that because that's an opinion I'm giving. But you know what? I'm not going to lose any sleep about it if I find out I'm wrong. So you should know that. Another thing you should know, I mentioned that Mark was copied by Matthew and Luke, um, but Matthew and Luke also share another relationship, which you should know about. You should know about it. I'm not gonna, it's not a New Testament course. I know that. I said that in the, in the video lecture. So I'm not laying some heavy stuff on you. Just some very simple, basic things that you might, you know, stumble across if, if you, uh, delve deeper. Okay. You, you know, you should know that Mark was the first gospel, that Mark was copied by Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke share Mark as a source, the gospel of Mark. But Matthew and Luke also share another source which scholars call Q. Don't ask why it's called Q. No one knows. <laughs> you know, no you know, no one really knows. You will sometimes hear, I'm just throwing this out there, you will sometimes hear people say that it comes from a German word Quelle. Quelle. That is not true. That is a little piece of um you know, a little, a little uh, piece of uh, what? What do you call it? Room, not rumor, but a little legendary material that gets passed around. E see, even amongst PhDs, okay? PhDs can believe in things that they haven't really checked out. But if you actually do check it out, we don't know where Q came from. It's probably related to the German word Quelle, but not the actual. It's probably used in a phrase by some scholar named jo Johannes um, Weisse, I think his name was. Um, or vice, I forget, I always forget if there's an E on the end or not. But anyways, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, is that this hypothetical source called Q was used by Matthew and Luke. Um, we, we don't have the source anymore. Um, we don't have any written documents of this thing called Q. Um, but we know that something like it existed. Why? Because Matthew and Luke share all sorts of material about Jesus in common that is not found in the Gospel of Mark. Okay? Um, it's added on to Mark. And it's mostly sayings. It's probably 90% sayings of Jesus. It's not doings of Jesus. Although there are a couple of stories, um, a miracle story and stuff about John the Baptist that are more like stories than sayings. But as I said, 90% of it is, you know, Jesus said this, Jesus says that, you know. So they call it a saying source. Anyways, um, Matthew and Luke didn't, didn't know each other. Okay, there, there is not a lot of evidence that either Matthew or Luke knew the other's gospel. So where did they get the same material from, you know? Um, if, I mean, if, if Luke were copying Matthew's gospel as well as Mark, then you could say, well, he got it from Matthew, you know, or vice versa. But the problem is, is that Luke does not seem to have known Matthew's gospel, nor vice versa. Matthew did not seem to know Luke. They both seem to have known Mark's gospel, okay, because the, almost the entirety of Mark's gospel is contained as the framework in each one of them. So that doesn't seem to be just, you know, um, a coincidence. And it also doesn't seem to be coincidental that you they have all of these sayings of Jesus that each one or organizes differently, by the way. Um, and they're all, So scholars are pretty much convinced that there was some kind of source, some kind of writing of sayings of Jesus that they used. And some scholars say, no, this was passed on by oral tradition. But, you know, let the scholars argue about that and pull their hair out about that. You just know Q, okay? What is Q? It's all the material about Jesus that Matthew and Luke have in common, but is not found in the Gospel of Mark, okay? The dates of the Gospels, I mentioned Q, and I mentioned that the canon was not set. Yes, during the time of Jesus... Neither the canon of, or the, the writings of the Jewish um, Tanakh, nor the writings of the Christian New Testament were settled. In fact, for a long period of time, decades in fact, there were no 
writing, Christian writings, okay, per se, all that the church had, all that Christian believers had, um, were stories about Jesus that were being told and retold. And if you wanted physical scriptures, like a Bible, well, then all you had were the Jewish writings. All you had was the Old Testament, the Tanakh, which doesn't have anything about Jesus. <laughs> you know, because it's all about before the time of Jesus. It was all written before Jesus ever, you know, ever uh, was born by, by his mother, Holy Mary. So, you know, and even those writings were not settled until much later. So that's a point that I wanted to make. Um, because oftentimes people can put the cart before the horse and think, well, as long as I have a Bible, I know Jesus. Well, these people didn't have a Bible. You know, people. there were people who were born and grew up, and some people who died, who in their whole life, you know, they couldn't go to the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of John and read. The Gospel of John hadn't been written yet. You know, let's say, you know, you were born around the turn of the century. Like, let's say you were born in 7 A.D., Okay, and you know people you know die around their seventies and sixties sixties or seventies, so let's say you even had a long, long life, even by ancient standards you you died in your seventies or eighties. The Gospel of John hadn't been written yet, apparently, you know, and maybe maybe the Gospels of Matthew and Luke had not been written yet. Maybe the only gospel you had ever heard of that had been written was Mark, and that was a novelty. If you look at the date, if you're dying around 80, even if you're 80 years old, a Christian at 80 years old in the first century AD, Mark would have been something new and fresh. Your whole life, what you would have heard in Christian worship and what you would have read as scripture would have been Genesis, Jeremiah, the Psalms, um, all of that stuff. Uh, so it was really an unsettled condition. The Bible, my point, and I think I do make this in the lecture, but I want to reiterate it as my last point before I, I part from you. The point is not that the church believes in a book. And this was in the catechism reading. The church does not proclaim the Bible. Okay. There's some people who are like, well, you know, I, you know, I, I, once you get saved, you go find a Bible believing church. No, I don't want that. I don't want a Bible-believing church. I want a Jesus-believing church. If a church is a Jesus-believing church, then obviously the Bible's going to be there. But also other things are going to be there as well, like bishops and the sacraments and the mother of Jesus, whom he loved and whom I love, and the saints and all sorts of other stuff. Okay, the Bible does not define Christianity. It's not Bible eanity. It's Christ eanity. It is the religion of the Messiah Jesus, whose name be praised and in whose name I bless you. Amen.